Yeah, thank you very much. And this session is for 30 minutes. It's about uh, ratings and rankings. We just saw a session that preceded ours. It was about handling pressure. So let me just take from where we left in the last session. Uh, today, the higher education ecosystem, there is pressure from different sites and on different stakeholders. The uh, institutional leadership is behind rankings and ratings. Uh, faculties behind the publications and students behind jobs. So there is a lot of pressure. So the opening question, I'll toggle questions between both of you before we take questions from audience if we have time. The first question to Professor Angrajan, you know, you know both, uh, both of you represent institutions which are top ranked as a university in NIRF, as an engineering institution, IIT Madras. Uh, the first question, Professor Angrajan, is there is always this confusion between ratings and rankings. You now, if somebody comes and says, you know, Carl Lewis won the 100 meters, and then contemporary uh, Daley Thompson was a decathlon gold winner. Now, why did he not win the 100 meters, or why Carl Lewis did not win the decathlon? So, but ratings and rankings are two different ball games. But there is this confusion that the best ranked institution should also have the best rating or vice versa. A good rated institution must also be a top ranked institution. So how do you, you know, add clarity to this confusion between ratings and rankings? What's your take on that? It's, uh, I, I don't think, you know, these are different aspects uh, of, of measuring an institution. So I, um, you know, you, um, rankings I think are something which probably more people are focused on um, because um, you give some sort of uh, numerical order uh, and uh, you know a highly rated institution uh, as you rightly pointed out may not uh, be the number one uh, ranked institution also um, I think it's more a matter I would I would not really you know give much importance to these I think more important is uh, that it's the institutions should aim for excellence. And it really doesn't matter uh, whether, uh, you know, you are highly rated or ranked. Um, it's, I somehow feel to, you uh, know, I fail to see what, uh, what the whole, uh, you know, importance about distinguishing such uh, things are. So I would say just uh, whatever it is, you, uh, you know, just focus on excellence. That is the key power point which, is, which finally matters. But do both of these work towards excellence or one is yeah. better than the other? No, no. I think both are in some sense, um, you know, I, as I said, different measures. That's all, different way of measuring. So it's safe to assume that there is no point in comparing, you know, rankings versus ratings because there is a lot of, uh, you know, confusion, a lot of uh, policy chaos, people reporting different, different uh, media groups raking this issue. So I think it's better to you know, begin with that clarity. Thank you very much. And uh, now to the ranking part. Now, I have this feeling, uh, you know, the IITs are actually uh, best represented in both the global rankings, whether it's QS or the Times Higher Education. But within the IITs, you know, some of them have chosen Times Higher Education. Some of them have chosen to participate in QS. So how do you actually ration the rankings? Now, why is that a group of IITs decided it's only QS? A different group decided it's only Times Higher Education. Why not all participate in both? So I will, uh, you, you are a little partial to me. You didn't ask the previous question. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I agree with uh, Ranga on this. We are basically going by principles of Bhagavad Gita. We do the karma. This rating, ranking is param, we don't really bother about it, to be very frank with you. And when we do the karma correctly, we see that the palam comes. And that has been true for both of us. Uh, we are leading these two institutions and we are seeing the results there. That's number one. Second thing is between, see, we are an academic institution. We have limited bandwidth. There is a need for looking at data. I fully agree. I, Ranga also agrees with us that we have to look at data. Data gives us a lot, very good insights. But then 
we look at data for NIRF, we look at data for, uh, so IIT Madras, we decided on QS, because we have been doing QS for concept. But then there are so many Shanghai ranking, that ranking, this times ranking. We, I can't put a dean for ranking. We don't have the bandwidth, nor there is an interest. So we want to do one international audit. We consider this like an audit. Somebody is doing, it's a third party. Is it a fair audit? Let me just interrupt that. Is uh, it a fair audit? I because really audit has, no. you know, a very transparent <laughs> framework. Is it transparent? Uh, for uh, NARF is very transparent. Not no. NARF, global. I'm talking just time. Who is ranking? Uh, see, the point is, again, when we actually look at ranking for ranking, we only start talking about transparency, okay? Today, QS ranking, we look at some of the parameters that come out. For example, sustainability has been added as a parameter, which is good for us. Is it measurable? It is measurable. We have seen that. So, uh, so last time, uh, you know, uh, we had a communication gap. So the data was not presented properly from IIT Madras. So we were something like 615 sustainability, but we have a school of sustainability. We do, uh, last year alone, uh, 300 crores was generated just on sustainability project. So I was wondering what has happened. And when we actually go through the, some of the data that they have given, there are a lot of very interesting points uh, that came up. And then this year we made a very concerted attempt to make a website and make these things available for them. The ja ranks jumped from some 650 to 340 or something like that. So 300 ranks, we came ahead of it. Correct. Right. But in this process, it's not just a number there. We did find out some very, very important points about sustainability, uh, where certain process have to be made in place, and how education is being uh, quantified there. So there is a very decent attempt made by QS to bring sustainability as a factor. So this is one example I'm giving you. So ranking in that way, uh, forget the transparency, whether it's correct, wrong, what formula they use. That's, but some very interesting, when we start looking at the data and start populating the, uh, the, the submission, we do get very good insight. But is that there, is very important. Since I agree with you yes. that, you know, data really determines where you stand. Uh, but is there a collateral damage? Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. That today ranking... Uh, more or less is becoming a pranking exercise where data is also manufactured because you need to be figured in the top ranked institution. So how do you ensure that there's integrity in the data? Again, Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. I, as an institute, I'm not behind the number. Okay. I, as an institute, we do good work. Rank is a consequence. If you're going towards the sun, the shadow follows you. Correct? Rank, I am, my son is my great work that I want to do, good work I want to do. The shadow is the rank. But have you if ever I, done If something? I leave that good work and tra start catching the shadow, shadow will go off, I know that. So, but have you, but mm. many institutions, mm. you know, ask the questions themselves. <clears throat> if I start doing this, my score in that ranking parameter will improve. Is that a good thing to do? No, it's not. See, there should be certain, that we are very clear. Mm. For example, uh, let me uh, uh, give an example. So, today there is citation per paper, okay. Now, we as an institute, put IIC and we, we are all working on large scale interdisciplinary projects. Exactly. So, gone are the days where I see papers with one faculty member and his students. Now we are seeing five faculty together. We have an energy consortium where there are 150 faculty, five faculty writing a paper. The bandwidth of a faculty is limited. So he can write some seven papers, eight papers, here, yeah, so sensible, good papers. So if five people write, then the citation is split across five. If each of them write seven, then my total count also increases and that citation also comes right. So this is a difference. Now, this is going to affect us very much on the QS ranking. But we are not bothered. Not bothered about we don't say, that, no, don't, don't do, do that, right? We don't do that. Yep. But on the other point, for example, there is one very interesting concept which QS has introduced called International Research Network, right? Now, I, I, I failed to understand that formula. Okay, I tried my best. I'm also a computer scientist. I've worked on numerical formulas also, done some numerical. But I, this formula, I couldn't understand. Forget it. But one small thing that we get is, so if, if a particular group works with another group, and in the last five years, they have published some three papers together, and it has some 10 citations each. 
then we recognize this as a network, which is a very good concept, right? Now we are seeing that our research network is some 35 people have done similar things. Yeah. Now this is when we are talking about international collaboration, we, we have on ICET now, uh, all of us are working on this. These are parameters which will help us grow. Yeah. Uh, Professor Angarajan, you know, the Indian Institute of Sciences, you know, is an institution that is for nation building. You know, that's the characteristic of that institution. And this ranking exercise, there are some global dimensions. And then, you know, it, it makes institution popular. And I always believe, you know, popularity will come with no invitation and will leave with no farewell. But if the ranking parameters by these global ranking agencies change by the drop of the hat next year, you know, institutions like yours cannot afford to, you know, change your roadmap for excellence and all of that. So Professor Kamakoti clearly said, you know, we are not having that at the back of the mind. And I'm sure IASC also doesn't have that back of your mind. But how do you crack the code? What is organic to IISC that it is always the most represented Indian institution in the global rankings? Yeah, I think uh, it's very important, as you rightly pointed out, Indian Institute of Science, we are 114 years old, and we have been a mother institution to many other institutions. Uh, so therefore, we take that role very uh, seriously. Um, as you know, many of the, uh, whether you take uh, Homi Baba, or you take, uh, you know, Vikram Sarabhai, they were all at IAC when they formulated either the space research program or uh, the, uh, you know, uh, atomic energy program. And, uh, you know, many, uh, many of the institutions, therefore, have come out of IAC. So we take that role very seriously. And even talking about uh, papers and citations, we do a lot of strategic uh, sector work where you can't even publish. You know, so many of Correct. the work, uh, that a lot of the work which we do cannot even be talked about. Uh, so you suffer in all those uh, areas, but that is unimportant. I think what is important is the nation building, and uh, we have been doing it for so many years that that is the focus that we have. And also, I think the most important product, as far as we are concerned, are our students. Correct. So as long as we train them well and produce good students, then I think uh, that is all uh, that matters. And then the results speak for themselves. You know, so many of the leaders in scientific institutions are uh, alumni of IAS. So therefore, uh, we have that, uh, you know, track record. And that is what I think we are most proud of, that uh, we have produced good students, good leaders, who then go on to head institutions, who become faculty of many institutions and go on to train many more students. I think uh, research excellence is the uh, one which allows us to do, do that, to train these people and uh, train these leaders. Because once you have the focus on research excellence, then the training that you impart to these students follows that path where you focus on producing a very excellent, you know, very um, good result. Yeah. And automatically, the culture of excellence is built into these students. The culture of hard work is built into these students. And that, those are the things which really carry them forward. Yeah. So uh, that is what has been, I think, yeah, the culture of IAC. And that is not really going to change. Yeah. Uh, I mean, terms. that's good news, actually. I mean, that's yeah. how it has to be also. Yeah. Right. Because we very rarely get institutions like IAC. Mm -hmm. And we cannot afford that to be you know, uh, a victim of rankings or yeah. ratings. Sir. Now, let me bring NIRF into the discussion, because that's also a ranking exercise. Uh, you know, uh, the United States of America and Canada play uh, ice hockey match amongst themselves, and they call each the world champion, whoever wins it. But because ice hockey is suited only to that, uh, you know, climate and all of that. Now, NIRF, likewise, you know, it is, it is actually designed for an Indian system. And uh, you are all at the thick of the policy making there at the NIRF. Now, how can we kind of globalize that? Because today, you know, uh, anything that India does also should have a global impact. Now, what do you think? Maybe I should pick both of your brains on how to globalize NIRF. How long can NIRF be a national ranking exercise? You have time, skewers. Can NIRF emerge a global ranking instrument? And what should we do? Yeah. So I think. There's really no barrier as such for uh, making an air of uh, ranking global. After all, if you look at one of the earlier rankings, well, the earliest probably was the U.S. news uh, ranking yeah. for the U.S. institutions. Um, so uh, 
or the um, uh, now what is called IARWU, the Shanghai rankings, they started out locally as rankings, even US news was mainly for US institutions. Uh, but once you achieve credibility locally, I think more and more people start to look at those rankings and then you can reach out to a global scale um, because what you need ultimately is, see there are two approaches. One is what Shanghai rankings take or the ARW ranking takes where you only look at parameters which you can gather independent of the institution. Okay. Then you have uh, rankings like QS where you also need inputs by Correct. the institution. Correct. Now if you're going the former route, there's absolutely no um, barrier, zero barrier for you going globally. All you have to do is whatever parameters you pick, you just uh, pick, uh, you know, evaluate them for all global institutions and publish a global ranking. As long as people find it credible, I think credibility is the key, as long as people find it credible and uh, also matches probably, that's very important, you know, it's a very subtle thing. If the ranking you publish is very uh, opposite to the perception that you have, then I think people that discount is. that ranking. So it's, uh, that's a very strange because you may have some parameters in your ranking which are picking up on things um, which may not lead to the perception game. You know, what, you know, people would always rate Harvard or Princeton or so on, yeah. uh, the top uh, ranked institution. And now if your ranking is looking at parameters which doesn't, you know, rate them very high. For example, in computer science, they are not a big institution, yeah. Harvard yeah. or uh, Princeton is, yeah, but still there are many institutions which are ahead of them in computer science. So if you have something which is more oriented towards computer science or the parameters which are important in computer science, uh, those institutions may not come. So initially there may be skepticism then, oh, what is it? Uh, we know, <laughs> we perceive these institutions to be the top institutions, why are they not ranked? So that I think is, could be one barrier, you know, if you pick, unless you pick the parameters uh, carefully. The, uh, some barrier will come when you're expecting institutions to provide data. Hmm. There, I think much more work is required to convince all the research universities to contribute data. Hmm. That will probably, what we should do is start regionally, you know, have all the um, regional institutions in our region take part, then uh, maybe go to Asia and so on and then expand. As you develop credibility, you expand to the Correct. whole world. So the first step is moving regional and then yeah, go unless global. Unless you pick the first approach, yeah. like the Shanghai rankings, you just base it purely on publicly available data. Then there's no barrier. You can okay. just publish. That's okay. Data. Thank you. You have any additional points on how to make one, it global? One you important thing that we must look at is every country has its as her own DNA. Hmm. Right? India has... We have our own, uh, you know, responsibilities. We are the largest democracy. The way we, we conduct our institute is different from the way the Western world does it. So we have our own commitments, social commitments, etc. So country-specific parameters have to be given and sufficient weightage have to be given. For example, how do you div define diversity in India? So if, if you know, our whole thing is unity in our diversity. Correct. So some people from far northeast come and study in IIT Madras. This is a diverse environment. Correct. Inna come from Germany and come study here. Correct. So these type of things have to be looked at very seriously, and uh, and the way institutes are run here. See, so our education is very subsidized, right? If you look at postgraduate education, compare it with other universities, it's very subsidized because the type of population that we need to address, the type of social commitments we have are different. Okay. So. So that is something which we need to bring. So if NIRF has to succeed as an international ranking, there must be some country-specific, uh, you know, blocks, which will be given some 50% weightage, and that must also be figured in. Okay, right. then, then let me pick your brain on that, because mm -hmm. that's a very important point. Because Scandinavian countries are very, very small. Morning jog, if you just, uh, you know, jog a little farther, you'll get into the other country also. Yes. Uh, so then that is international actually yes, in yes. the world rankings. Sure. Now India is also, you have say, mm -hmm. rightly said, complexities. Now has NIRF adequately addressed those complexities at the Indian context itself? I feel that, you know, there is still, you will have to do some cross weightage to remove these distortions. Sir. Yeah, so as a system, NIRF, we have been involved with that even at the, you know, formation stage, IIT Madras, uh, IIC, everybody we were involved on that. 
uh, as a system it is evolving right so this time uh, there is a sustainability is brought in there's an innovation project. how do you measure innovation i am really surprised innovation so, is getting ranked right? it's very qualitative how do you measure it innovation can be measured in terms of number of patents that are granted so it's granted by yeah, yeah. so there is a, a process that is involved in basically uh, getting it so number of patents is very important there then technology transfers that have happened and then uh, you know the startup companies which have exited and become not necessarily unicorns but you know uh, two stage two stage three funding so these are all some of the data that they are basically collecting this time and uh, there is a measure that is coming i'm sure over a period of time this will get evolved and uh, uh, we will come out with whatever is a common denominator there and as you have seen over last uh, eight years uh, uh, the, the the whole thing has been evolving and we are getting more representations uh, done and implemented also but and the innovation data mm. professor rangarajan can also add you know the more and more somebody uh, you know is uneducated there is a lot of ideation happening i mean we are missing that mm. uh, we assume that the innovation is happening only in institutions sir. are we missing the real innovation outside it doesn't mean that we've got to rank non education institutions mm. but do we have an innovation innovation measurement framework in place we have announced the ranking but are we having a good framework to measure in innovation in some sense what uh, this innovation actually says is it's looking at the number of incubated startup in a incubator right for example iit madras incubator we don't just uh, incubate startups from our own students we also nurture other other in university students or other outsiders also to come in but so that's, I, that's 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 okay i mean if you have a separate ranking for innovative universities now there are many derivative ranking instruments that's coming like even if it's times or qs qs says emerging universities asian mm -hmm. universities brick Correct. nation and all Correct. of that uh. so can this not be a derivative ranking then bring innovation into the mainstream ranking where only few institutions no, no, have in that capacity innovation is uh, now a separate category correct it's a separate category so that is a separate separation that is just done. like research just like research is a separate category innovation is a separate category and in the overall also there is a component of innovation that is added into this so that way innovation has become a separate category so so i am sure within uh, we see uh, uh, in the overall ranking institutes that are rated even above 150 are within the top 10 in innovation correct that has happened right so even last year we have some very interesting examples and when we go and start looking at those institutions yes there is there is a little really there is a component there so as a uh, 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 prof rangarajan mentioned the credibility is also getting established now correct there is also a cross verification happening like okay this institute we didn't not do but why it that came so this type of a thing it is evolving so i think it's a very good exercise as i find out yeah. prof rangarajan you said you know isc is the the mother institution now what's your plan to take care of the child institutions how do you mentor institutions on the ranking and ratings because today even policy decisions are linked with ratings and rankings as a responsible mother how are you going to mentor other institutions sir? I, i think you know we re, i don't think we directly mentor any institution i think as i said it's only our uh, uh, you know students who go on and uh, you know be part of these institutions so uh, what the way we can mentor is by setting an example uh, so directly because each institution has its own constraints has its own resources uh, the geographical location all these play a very important role um, so there is i think that is something the institution has it has to figure uh, figure out on its own so the best mentoring that we can provide as uh, indian institute of science is to set an example where we say that you see we have sort of weathered all these storms you know we were pre independence the independence happened so many you know ugc all these happened after <laughs> you know we were set up long ago Correct. so we have gone through all these uh, changes and have still kept the excellence on top so for in india for an institution to maintain its status for 114 years is not a joke you know yep. typically things start declining after some Correct. time so i think that is the best example that we can provide that you can always maintain that quality and excellence over a long period of time 
Um, and I think, I'm sure that... So we'll be Ekalavya Institution seeing you and we will be self-motivated, looking at you staying at the top for almost 110 years plus. Yeah. Now, leadership is also very, very important and that's going to be my last part. You know, you have both the institutions had illustrious predecessors as directors of the institution. Now, what are you going to expect from your successors later? How are they going to handle the pressure now? Now it's becoming cutthroat competition, not at national level, at global level also. So how, how, how are you going to look at your uh, next director? What is that you want to tell your next director? Yeah, I think what is very critical, and I think that is missing in many Indian institutions, but it's happening more and more, and even the government is becoming aware of it, is to have a pipeline. You know, it's very important that you groom, like they do in companies, you have to groom future directors and vice chancellors of these universities. So, for example, what I have personally done is all the deans that I have selected for um, the various divisions and various roles uh, are all around 50, you know, so that they have enough time, you know, uh, even once my term ends, they have enough runway for them to develop and develop leadership qualities and become serious competitors for these positions. So I, I think it's very important that we start at an younger age. Often in many institutions, it goes by seniority. Uh, somebody very, you know, who will retire in a few years is made, uh, made the dean. Then, uh, you know, one is they don't probably have the enthusiasm. They are working out the retirement plans uh, more than uh, what, uh, what the institution should be doing. But they also, you know, they really cannot contribute because they have retired very soon. Yeah. So I think it's very important to give leadership responsibilities to young people. You know, so right in um, uh, my own institution, Satish Dhawan, who headed both IAC and uh, ISRO simultaneously for 10 years, he became director at 42. Yeah. Uh, so somehow, you know, that is the sort of uh, risks we have to take. We have to appoint young people in leadership positions. And, uh, you know, you look globally, most of the uh, leaders of big companies are all very young people. Yep. I mean, you look at startups. These are, uh, you know, kids who become CEOs and do so well. So I think we have to trust our youth. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, being... Uh, at least in IAC, we have gone down to 50, but other things, we should even go down below. I mean, so uh, that is something which is very important, I think. Yeah. Uh, developing a pipeline, giving them enough opportunities to develop leadership qualities, Correct. Correct. and then evaluate them. Yeah, Professor Kama, I know, you, know you, you might get a second term also, because the way IIT Madras is all over, uh, you know, beyond that, you know, I, I saw the recent event that you had, your three previous directors, yeah. all of them you know, addressing, and that was a wonderful event, you know, a lot of inspiration from that. Sure. So what is that you will tell your uh, successors? You know, because that is also linked with rating, ranking, and, you know, they need to build institutions for larger purposes. Sure. So uh, as uh, Professor Ranga mentioned, so uh, just to add about mother institutions, 70% of our faculty of IIT Madras had some touch point with IAC. IAC I was a yeah. postdoc at IAC, so that's, that's one thing that we derive a lot of inspiration. If you ask what IISC has done to the nation, it's what that they have done. So somebody asked, I, I studied in Venkateshwara College. Somebody asked, the IIT Madras is NAR of one. What is SVC doing? They said, we are preparing directors for SVC. <laughs> IIT Madras, okay. So that was the answer. So as rightly pointed out, see, we are looking at uh, creating a very strong pipeline. Not just one, but so f 10, 10 people who will be in a position to take the vision of the predecessor. It's very, very important that the vision must not change. change. An institute cannot afford a change in a vision. Correct. For example, 20 years before Professor Anand decided, I call him grandfather, he decided that we need to do uh, translational work. And that is what IIT Madras is capable of in a very big way. And we started the research path. Today we have 400 companies, $5 billion is the evaluation of the companies. So then, uh, pro then six years at least he was, uh, he had groomed uh, Professor Bhaskar as a dean. And then that whole uh, uh, tenure of Professor Bhaskar, Made a difference. The, the, the basic ideas as what was, uh, you know, there is some basic fabric and that we never changed. And then I was also a dean, I was on, involved in administration for six to seven years, along with Bhaskar, very close quarters. And COVID did a lot of bad things. One good thing is we had a lot of time to discuss during COVID. Because no, no travel, nothing. 
And that, I personally was groomed very nicely to take over. So it was a state where if somebody is not bothered about admin, they would not have known that the director has changed. So that was the smoothness by which transition has happened. Uh, so that is very, very important for any institute. So what we are also doing is that all our deans, uh, we are grooming the deans, uh, take up administrative positions, be in very important committees today. See, we are now in a very large democracy. There is a lot of, lot of expectations from our institution. Right, so, so responsibilities. yeah, responsibilities and expectations, and uh, right from you know uh, school education. Say what is you know what is our contribution? STEM. Uh, all of us are doing a lot of work on STEM, right? So these things have to be you know basically uh, you know be part and parcel of the dean's work. So that is also coming very much, and uh, we are also very much focusing on getting more women involved in leadership. Good. So women Good. leading uh, IIT. Uh, we know, uh, our Zanzibar campus, mm. uh, Preeti has taken over. Yeah. Uh, she's IIT Bombay alumnus, yep. and uh, uh, she did uh, PhD abroad, and she joined our faculty. So she's taken up. So we are also try, uh, trying more and more uh, women into coming into the leadership position. That's so good. these that's, are some of the uh, important things. That we have done. just time for two quick questions from the audience. Uh, the student good morning, gentlemen. So we have seen that IIT, IITs have been accessible only for uh, particular students who kill a clear JE before four or five years. But recently, we have, uh, we have a direct connection with the IITs through BS Data Science program or through other incubation projects. Uh, so is there any link with the ratings for the uh, uh, reason? Uh, the, is there any reason for that? Are uh, you incentivizing? Does ranking and ratings incentivize your uh, no, online no, programs? No. So we are doing, is, uh, so what uh, today United Nations calls as SDG 4, Sustainable Development Goal 4. Every institution has to be adhering to some of the sustainable development goals. And youngsters, if you don't know what are the sustainable development goals, please go and read it from the UN website. So SDG 4 is talking about affordable, equitable, accessible education for all and equal opportunities. And this entire uh, BS data science program has been conceived essentially based on that uh, idea. So we are not, it's not linked to any ranking or uh, actually, I don't know, it may have even negative impact on the ranking because we have more students and our faculty to student ratio. Okay. I have 25,000 students today, ladies and gentlemen, uh, enrolled in the BS Data Science program. And we have 5,000... But 000, you have international students also, no? You will gain there. I don't know. So 5,000 students are below poverty line and we are supporting them through scholarship. So this is what we have made as an outreach. So that's a uh, very quick answer to your uh, question. The gentleman there? Can I ask a question? Yeah. This is to you, Professor Rangarajan. Uh, you are talking about, both of you said about grooming, about, uh, you know, uh, in leadership position, etc. IIC, for example, doesn't really um, employ teachers who are pass outs of the institute, say, uh, PhD scholars, etc. Why is that so? That is something I've always wondered. I mean, yeah, inbreeding. See, it's not, it's, I wouldn't say it's a very hard and fast rule, but I think most institutions typically would, you know, we want our students to go elsewhere, you know, because uh, that is part, I think, of the responsibility of all institutions. So to encourage that, we have such rules. And also, you want more fresh ideas to come in. So if you have uh, a professor and that professor student uh, then again joins the group, it's the same set of ideas, the basic set of ideas don't change. So to promote more innovative ideas, fresh ideas to come in, it's always better that somebody from outside uh, comes to IAC uh, rather than somebody who's already a graduate. That is, it's, if somebody has done, um, you know, master's or undergraduate degree, it's fine, but it's only at the PhD level we, uh, you know, we have, uh, because it's basically for that reason, yeah. Yeah, last question, yep. Yes. I have two questions for you. One is generic, another one is controversy. So which one you choose? You know, what to choose? Both. Uh, yeah. Make it short. Make it, yeah. Hmm. Why is that IIT is being seen as a gateway to the West? People who get graduated from IIT choose to work for the other countries. Uh, answer. You said last, DNA is different. Correct. Answer to your question. Last five years, the number of people who have gone abroad is 5%. Next. Let's see, let's see, next. Come out and open. The next is, how do you counter the controversy of giving priorities to the lecturers belong to a different sect in the society. Uh, we have a, now the national, uh, the central education 
Uh, repeat your question. I didn't get it for me. The representation of faculties has to be from the different sect in the society. Ah, inclusive so they recruitment. Say, yeah, inclusive recruitment. Inclusivity. Yeah, no, we have, uh, so the Central Education, uh, uh, Central Education Institution Act, the CA Act, has now uh, uh, mandated certain uh, reservation at every level, and we follow what we call as a roster, right? Roster, uh, it's a central government uh, designed thing, which uh, basically ensures that every community is given that many uh, uh, things. So I'm also very happy to tell you the last two years, 2019, it has been uh, implemented. So in the last four years of our agreement, we don't have a single backlog uh, in the faculty and staff recruitment. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Big round of applause. As always, wonderful to talking to both of you. Thank you very much.